right, good morning. How are you? How are you? Yeah, we got some life in here. It's good to be with you. As uh, Matt mentioned last week, he didn't just mention it, I'm so used to saying that. We're in this series, Upside Down, week two, and we're talking about what God can speak into our lives to help lead us toward things like financial peace and freedom and influence. And if you missed last week, and if you miss any messages, you can catch up with us online at myfcc.life, which I really want to encourage for this series because every week builds on the last, okay? Today, we're going to talk about what we do with our money when we finally get some, okay? I remember the first time I finally got some money. I was in third grade, I was eight, and I am an entrepreneur at heart, so I did what every entrepreneur does, and I started a business. So I went into my bedroom, I grabbed everything I didn't want that I knew everyone else would like, which is what entrepreneurs are really good at, right? And I decided that I was going to take it, put a price tag on it, put it in a duffel bag, get on my bike, and go door to door selling all of my junk, all right? And so I got some money, got some money. I don't know that the little old lady who bought my Frisbee for 50 cents really needed my Frisbee, nor did the older gentleman who bought my baseball that was all worn out and scuffed up. But I got some money that day. At the end of the day, I had $2.50 or $3. I did what every eight-year-old boy does. I got on my bike, rode down into the middle of our town outside of St. Louis, Missouri, and I bought Topps baseball cards. For 40 cents a pack. Anyone in here? You know what I'm talking about? I opened every one of those, and inside of every Topps pack was a nasty piece of chewing gum. It was chalky. It had been there since the 60s, okay? And you take that gum, okay, you eat it, then you go to the dentist and get dental repair done. And I took that gum, I chewed it, every one of those seven packs, especially whatever I made, and then I went through my cards one at a time, and I was a happy man. I was a happy young man, okay? And thus my financial habits were formed. That's how I lived my life. You make a little money, you spend a little money. You make a lot more money, you spend a lot more money. You make more money as an adult than you could have ever imagined as an eight-year-old, and you spend more money than you could have ever imagined, right? And that's how my life went. Now I want you to look at someone next to you and say, that's not smart, okay? Do that. Say, that is not smart. You're right. It's not smart, but it took me a long time to learn that spending everything I made, and in many cases, spending more than what I made, was not a wise way to walk through life. Now, I will not ask for a show of hands, but how many of us have learned that lesson? All right? And how many of us, without a show of hands, I'm not looking for this, how many of us are still learning that lesson? Right? Statistics say, A significant amount of us in the room today are still learning that spending everything we have, and oftentimes more than what we have, is a reality, right? It's a reality for us. Listen to these statistics. The average household owns 300,000 items, okay? you got to spend a lot to get 300,000 items. Interesting, we don't have this statistic, but 10% of Americans have so many items in their home, they need off-site storage to store the other other hundreds of thousands, right? Number two, 66% of adults believe shopping can cure boredom, okay? I'm just here to tell you, if you believe that's true, you'll spend most of what you have, all right? Number three, the average car loan is $27,000, Number four, the average debt per household, and this is credit card debt for those carrying a balance, is $15,611. 62% of Americans have less than $1,000 in savings. 51% of Americans didn't invest a single dollar in 2017. And get this, finally, number seven, 60% 60 of households spend more than they make Every year. Now, those are startling statistics. And the truth is that most of us at some point in our lives have developed some very unwise spending habits. And if you're like me and you have my story at parts of my life, you know, those habits can lead to tension, they lead to conflict, they lead to restlessness. 
And they have a way of making their way, the tension, into other areas of our lives. For example, financial tension affects our bodies. Many of us know we sleep less when we're worried about our money. It affects our work habits. Many of us are working longer hours to pay for something we bought last year. For many of us in our homes, it makes us rest less. We're restless in our homes. There's tension there because of our finances. It affects our marriage. Some of you today may have more conflict in your marriage because of money. And finally, it affects our generosity. Because the more unwise we become in our spending habits, the less we will give for the good of our neighbors and for the glory of Jesus to cause us close to his heart. And what I want you to do is look at this list. Look at this list for a moment. And I want to just show you, uh, you have no list to look at, so I'm going to tell you. I want you to think about that list for a moment, okay? Think about a marriage where there's more conflict. Think about a home where there's restlessness. Think about sleep where you have none, right? Think about working long hours. I want you to think about that for a moment and just consider, are any of those true in my life today? Are they true in my life today? And if so, what I want to do in these next few moments is to encourage you. Last week I said in this series, we are not going to look back and feel badly about the poor financial decisions we've made because so many of us, including myself, have made them. What we're doing is looking forward and saying, there's a better way. There's a better way. God has a different plan for our lives. We said last week, if this is what the culture considers normal, debt is normal, student loan debt is normal, right? Living a lifestyle I can't afford is normal. Conflict and tension are normal. If that's normal, then followers of Jesus understand that Jesus does not lead us to live a normal life. It's not what he calls us to do. He calls us to live differently, an upside down life. And today I want to give you four timeless principles of the upside down life that I believe if you will begin to practice them, and develop these habits in your life, in your marriage, in your home, I think God's going to do a new work for you. Starting today, four timeless principles of the upside-down life. Here we go. Number one, the first principle is know where it goes. Know where it goes. Say that with me. Know where it goes. All right? Meaning, you've got to know where your money goes. Now, some of you say, is that seriously principle number one? That's all you have for us, okay? Yes, it's principle number one. And here's why it's so important. According to statistics by the U.S. Bank, 40% of Americans say they use a budget. 60% of Americans do not know where their money goes month to month. I told you last week that in, in the midst of all the financial mistakes I've made, one of those mistakes was that I didn't get on a budget until well into my 20s. I was living outside of St. Louis with Beth and my two young kids. We were living on a very modest salary. And I remember every month coming to the end of the month and our finances were just bleeding. Anyone been there? I mean, you come to the end of the spreadsheet and it's all red. You may not know, but red is not your best friend when it comes to your finances, okay? There's a better way. So we would come to the end of the month and we would be in the red every month. And so at this time in our lives, we were introduced to a great organization called Financial Peace University. Now, Financial Peace University has seven steps toward financial freedom. I would encourage you to check those out. But the foundational step before you even get to step one is to get on a budget. And for Beth and I, that was life-changing. I remember sitting down on the couch for the first time, and detailing out our expenses compared to our income. And what we discovered was that every month we were spending $600 more than what we were making. Now, let me ask you, if you every month spend $600 more than what you're making, how long will it take for you to go broke? Like a month, right? And how long will it take for you to be dead broke? about a month and a half, okay? That's what you got. And so we were in a deep way in trouble, and so what we decided to do was to get on a budget, and we detailed our expenses, and we began to cut expenses out, and we said goodbye to ESPN. I know, it's hard. 
and we said goodbye to Joanna before she was even a thing. And we just begin to methodically say we've got to live on less. And when we did that, our finances begin to take a significant change. You have got to know where your money goes. And so for many of us, what that means today is you have got to find a budgeting resource that will enable you to track every dollar that you spend. Now, I don't have time to go into how we create a budget, but I do want to give you two tools if you're taking notes. I think one of the best tools out there by Financial Peace is called Every Dollar. You can go to everydollar.com. It's also an app you can get on your phone. Beth and I don't use Every Dollar or share with you another tool that we use, but everydollar.com will help you learn to zero-base budget, which means you create a budget which at the end of the day, in the end of the month, you're allocating every dollar you make towards something. Generosity, saving for the future, uh, investing in tomorrow, preparing for um, your kids, whatever it might be your priorities are, and having a working day-to-day budget that it allocates your expenses. And you've got to have a budget, okay? The tool that we use is Mint. It's a great tool. We use it online and on our phones. Great online app, and you can get that and track all of your resources. It integrates all the money you're making through your accounts into your working budget, and it lets you know how you're tracking month to month. I would encourage you, you got to get on a budget, and you got to know where your money goes. It's principle number one. Number two, principle number two, you've got to learn to say no. Say that with me. Learn to say no. That's right. No, I will not keep up with the Kardashians, right? No, I will not keep up with the Joneses or the Smiths or whoever my neighbor happens to be. And we've got to learn to say no. Now, one of the great truths in Scripture comes out of all the writings that Solomon did in Ecclesiastes and in Proverbs, and he has so much to say about our resources. But on and on he'll tell us about the importance of diligence and discipline when it comes to our finances. And he wrote his work based upon a command and a list of commands that God had given to the Hebrew people early on, well before he even came along. And one of those commands wrapped up into what many of us might know as the Ten Commandments, which were given by God to the Hebrew people, comes in verse 17 of Exodus chapter 20. And here's what God says to the people. He says, you must not covet. You must not covet. Now, covet doesn't simply mean that I look at your ride and I think that's a nice ride. Or that I look at your house and think, oh, you got a really nice house. That's not coveting. Coveting means that I look at what you have and I have to have what you have. It it means I look at what you drive and I say, I've got to have what you drive. And I don't have the ability to say no. Listen, this starts when we are young. I remember as a young guy, you know, all of my friends were getting their kind of nicest, greatest Nike shoes. And what did I do? I went to a little French store with my mom called Target and got (laughs) shoes that looked like Nike. Any of you ever shop there? Okay. And when I looked at my friend's shoes, I think, I've got to have those. I've got to have those. And I started to covet in my heart. Now, it continues when we get older and we hear that our friends or our colleagues are taking kind of this dream vacation to Aruba or, uh, you know, Jamaica or whatever it might be, uh, you know, they're all uh, Costa Rica, uh, and they're just all in an uh, and you're just like, you have this conversation, you're like, ah, right? And you and your family, all you're planning is spending the weekend as a Lake Manawa, uh, right? (laughs) What do you do with that? I'm not bagging on Lake Manawa, but there are other places, okay? And all of a sudden in your heart, you start to covet and you start to think, what is my weekend vacation down by the river when I could be going across the country and and into another place to enjoy the beach and the warmth, right? And in your heart, what happens? You start to covet. And in those moments, you think, I've got to have what you have. And instead of saying, no, I don't need more, or no, I can't afford more, we say, yes, I'm going to get more, and we spend the money we don't have. Now, for most most of us, this habit starts out really small. 
We start by spending money we don't have on entertainment or on clothing or on going out to eat. And we think, oh, we're going to go out to eat tonight and then we'll pay it off on Friday when we get paid. But this habit begins to grow and with time we purchase new furniture on a buy now, pay later plan. Or we use our good buddy Visa to buy the ultra 4K HD TV because our LED HD TV didn't show Netflix nice enough, okay? And we think, I got to have it. And we spend money we don't have. Or we take a vacation on the bonus, you ever done this, that we hope to get next month. Got to get out of town. And then with time, the habit continues to grow. And we buy a brand new car we can't afford, or we incur student loans that will take decades to repay, or we take on the highest mortgage that the bank will lend us, believing they're complimenting us by giving us more than we can afford. You ever been there? And we develop a habit of having to have what we don't have and spending money we don't have to get what we don't have. And we live ourselves into a lifestyle that, financially speaking, is upside down. But listen to Solomon in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. He says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. He says, for those of us with the, without the ability to say no, we compromise our well-being. We actually compromise our family's well-being. And financially speaking, we're living like a city with no defense. And all it takes is a bad day or a pink slip or a rainy moment And our finances and our family are compromised. And Solomon says, don't do it. Learn to say no. In fact, statistics say that 80% of Americans today are caught up in the chains of debt. Meaning 80% of us are struggling to say no to the things we don't have that we want. Now I want to be clear, the Bible doesn't say that going into debt is a sin. Okay? But it does regularly say that going into debt is unwise. I think there are potentially wise ways to accrue debt for a short period of time in appreciating assets. You might invest in a home, okay, that's going to appreciate, hopefully. You might invest in a business where you have to take on some debt in order to move into the future with the plan that you have. That's okay, I think. But where most of us get into problems is where when we spend money on depreciating assets, things that are worth less tomorrow than the day that we bought them, and so we're spending money we don't have on clothing or on cars, right? We're spending money that we don't have on purchases that are worth less than they were when we purchased them. And Solomon would say, oh, if you walk into this lifestyle, you're going to live like you have broken down walls. And he says, I want you to know that there's a better way. There's a better way. In fact, listen to his words in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Solomon says, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless like chasing the wind. He says, you want to learn to say no. You want to develop self-control. He says the key to that is to enjoy what you have rather than dreaming about what you don't have. He says be grateful for what God's giving you. Be content with what He's provided you with. You say, well, how do you do that? Let me give you one little key to do that with. One of the simplest ways to live a grateful, content life is to look around at all the people who have what you don't have and to silently declare them the winner. Okay? Silently declare your neighbor the winner. You have the nicest house. Don't publicly declare it, okay? I mean, you might tell them you got a great house, but don't say you have the nicest house. Okay, don't say that. But silently declare you got the nicest house. Silently declare your other neighbor has the nicest landscaping, right? Silently declare in your heart that your colleague has the nicest car. You'll never have a car like him. Silently declare that your friends are taking the nicest vacation. Declare them the winner and be content with second place. Because the moment you can declare someone else the winner, you take the pressure off of you to have what they have. And instead you say, I'm going to live a wise life when it comes to my resources. And it begins with learning to say no. 
So you want to live an upside down life? You got to know where your money goes. And you got to learn to say no. And number three, you've got to save so it grows. Save so it grows. In other words, after you honor God first, and we'll talk about this in a moment, for followers of Jesus, we honor God with the best and the first of what he's provided for us. Then the second step is we pay ourselves. And we begin to save for tomorrow. Listen, you don't want to be like the guy who says, I've got enough money to last as long as I live, as long as I die by next Tuesday. Okay? You don't want to be that guy. And so you've got to begin investing for tomorrow, making the advanced decision to set aside money for our future. And you know, the beauty of saving money is you don't have to save a lot of money to earn a lot of money. Proverbs chapter 13 says, wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears. But wealth from hard work grows over time. You love that? Wealth from hard work grows over time. And this is describing what is often referred to as the miracle of compound interest. Some of you say, I'll never be able to save a lot. The beautiful thing is you don't have to save a lot. You only have to save a little. And Solomon says, little by little, that savings will begin to grow. Let me give you an example. For those of you who are around 25 years or younger, if you begin to, at age 25, start saving $10 a day, you say, $10 a day? I could never save $10 a day. Well, that's probably less than your fast food addiction or caffeine habit, right? You start saving saving $10 a day, every day, every month, putting it into an account like an IRA or a 401k, maybe through your employer or a mutual fund, and you get average gains on that investment. Do you know how much that $10 a day would be worth by the time you're 65 in just 40 years? That would be worth $1.7 million, give or take. It's the miracle of compound interest, of saving little by little by little so that it begins to grow. Now, for some of us who struggle with the discipline to do that, I get that. And so what Beth and I do is we automate two things in our lives. We automate our generosity out of our bank accounts so that it comes out every time we get paid to the the places we've chosen to give to. And then we automate our savings and investments so that it gets into our investment plan before I'm tempted to spend it, okay? And so it comes from our employer right into a plan, and it grows. Now, here's the beautiful thing. Have you ever gotten one of those investment statements in the mail where you open it up and it begins to show you how your investments are growing slowly day by day by day? And you look at it and you say, this is worth a lot more than what I've actually put into it. Because Solomon's wisdom is true. Wealth that day by day over time is invested grows slowly but steadily. And if you want to live an upside down life that is different from what our world considers normal, you've got to save so it grows. In the same way, if you want to move away from things like worry or stress or conflict or anxiety and experience a life filled with joy and peace and freedom, I want to encourage you to begin practicing these simple upside down down principles. Now, there's one more principle. And I want to share it with you this morning, and then we're going to finish our series next week by talking about this principle entirely. And this fourth principle really is the first principle for everyone who says, I'm a follower of Jesus. In fact, everywhere you go in Scripture, we see time after time that this becomes the foundation of our finances as followers of Jesus. And here's what it is. Number four, trust the one who knows. Can you say that with me? Trust the one who knows. All right, let's say it like we mean it. Right? I don't know. All right? Trust the one who knows. That's right. Listen to this promise. Philippians chapter four. And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Paul says the question at the end of the day when it comes to our resources, 
after hearing all of God's wisdom, is do you and I believe it? And will we trust Him? Ultimately, how we decide to respond to God's wisdom comes down to whether or not we trust Him. And I'm genuinely surprised by the amount of followers of Jesus that I meet who haven't been willing to trust God in this area of their life. Think about that with me for a moment. If you're a follower of Jesus, and and listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, just hear the heart of God for you in this. But really, I want to speak to the church for a moment. It genuinely surprises me how many of us, and hey, I've been here, I've been here, would say, I trust God for my eternity, but I don't trust Him with my economy. I trust Him with my prayer requests and my daily decisions, but I don't trust Him with my dollars and my investments. And I just wonder where God wants to stir a new work in the lives of those of us who are living with a crippled confidence in a big God who created us and knows us by name and called us from the depths of sin and declared that we're His sons and daughters and promised to provide for us day after day after day for our joy and then leads us in wise financial principles and says, will you trust me? Will you follow me? Will you give back to me? Will you honor me with what I've given you? I just wonder for some of us today if the Holy Spirit of God is going to go to work in our lives dealing with what for me is, listen, what for me is the most basic part of me learning to live God's way financially, and that is today, will I trust Him? Will I trust Him? So today, I wonder for many of us if it's going to be a a stake in the ground kind of moment as we make the hard decision which has incredible payoffs to learn to live God's way. I want to bring up the list again of our four financial principles. I'm going to read them for you one more time and I just want you to hear as as I read them for you, maybe what the Spirit of God might be using the truth from Scripture to say to you today. Right. So number one, know where your money goes. Number two, Learn to say no. Number three, begin saving so it grows. And at the end of the day, trust the one who knows. Now, I'm going to give you a moment, and I just want you to look at that list. And quietly interact with God in this place and just say, God, what are you teaching me here? Where do you want me to grow in this, in this area? Maybe one or, what are one or two steps that I know you're just doing business with me right now And you want to challenge me to walk in a new way. I believe that if you will begin to act on that one step or two steps today, God can do a new work in your life. I believe it because I've seen it. Beth and I believe it because we've experienced it. And like you, we're continuing to pursue God's plan for our lives. So I want to pray for you. And I want to encourage you as we go from this place to begin to walk His way in an upside-down way of life. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank You for Your wisdom. We thank You for Your constant care for us. We thank You that You love us enough to speak into the most, what for many of us are the most important areas of our lives, including our money. And today I know in this place that including myself, so many of us are still learning. So many of us are just starting. I pray that you would give us hope and courage that today can be a new day. That we don't need to continue to walk uh, the way of the culture. We don't need to continue walking the way of anxiety and restlessness and, and bondage in our finances, but there's a new way of peace and freedom and influence. Holy Spirit, would you settle that truth into the deepest parts of who we are? Would you lead us from this place to have life-changing conversations, to make direction-shifting decisions, and will we wake up one day looking back and say, that's the day when you begin a new work in our lives financially. God, give us wisdom. We need you. 
And we pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, we